I hope that, uh, that, uh, that well, that there, there was an attempt by me to, to have some continuity through the course and uh, I think Kishan will help to, to uh, smooth that path forwards. The first half of the course, by the way, unless uh, in case I hadn't already said it or you hadn't noticed, is on um, microscopy and um, essentially ballistic imaging or uh, at least not diffuse imaging and later on when you want to go deeper into the tissue we start to use diffuse light and we'll get into all of those uh, methods and somewhere in between uh, Adrian is going to make a diff difficult transition by talking to us about optical aquarius tomography which is, is, is right I suppose at, at the limit of ballistic imaging. Uh, so over to Keishan and thank you very much. Thanks Martin and thanks for the opportunity <laughs> to be here. Um, so I'm Kishan Balaki, I'm from the University of St Andrews in Scotland. Um, I'm actually a quantum physicist by training. Um, and then I did a lot of work in nonlinear optics and I stumbled into bio and now we do, well we're working lots of different things. Um, but what I want to show you today is um, one of the things I'm passionate about, not just for biophotonics but just in science, is shaping light. So, um, I don't have a laser pointer, this is going to have certain to my little three laser pointer. But a laser mm -hmm. comes out as a simple, what we call a Gaussian light beam, a spot, TM00 mode, has some properties. But a lot of science at the moment is benefiting from shaping that beam, um, both in space and time. And Colin touched upon some of these ideas already in his, his, his lovely lectures this morning, giving examples of structured illumination, um, temporal aspects as well stead and so forth. Um, and I'm just going to show you some examples of how this can be applied. So I'm going to, I've picked four topics that um, look all completely different, but I'm going to try and hook, link them up and have some continuity. But the main thing I just want you to remember is by shaping light you can actually push things a little bit further and better. And I'll give you some examples um, of work around the world that's um, really setting the agenda here. Um, Right, so um, we're going, I guess, on the Atlantic coast. So St Andrews is on the North Sea. So we're on the, uh, so there's the British Isles. That's where we are, in case you didn't know. I didn't know where it was, actually, when I went for an interview. <laughs> I bought a train ticket to Edinburgh and realized I had another 50 miles to go. Uh, so <laughs> um, it's just an hour northeast of Edinburgh. Um, it's a small university. The town's only 15,000 people. Um, and uh, the students is another eight or nine thousand. It's, it's become a little kind of international town, really. It's, uh, it's not very Scottish, um, but it's a great little place to live and work. And that's where I am here in the physics building. Uh, that's the old course where they say golf was invented five minutes away. Can't go there and have your lunch or put up a picnic, but you can walk by. Um, and you can see there also that we have um, a school of medicine. So uh, my working colleagues has resulted in a frightening investment we have to somehow pay back, as always, which is, I got, uh, so that, that black arrow more or less denotes roughly where my office is, and I've got labs in physics and also medicine, and medicine is now linked through this little bridge here um, to physics, so we've got labs in there as well, so I can, depending on what I have to in the morning, what, what experiments need, my assistants can do that. It's funny, in physics, so my office is here, but I started over here, and it used to be that as you went up the academic food chain, 
you got a slightly better office. And the hope was, why uh, when you became professor, you ended up on this side of the building, this beautiful view <laughs> out across the sea. And by the time I got there, I was facing this big granite wall. <laughs> so I had to make do with that. But you know, I got some labs in medicine, so that was pretty cool. Anyway, so it's a fun place, but it shows one of the things that I think is important, and you will all be invariably acutely aware of this, which is that science, all of the science in um, biomedicine is interdisciplinary. We might need chemists, we need statisticians, we need physicists, we need biologists, etc., um, to really push these ideas and find out where they can actually make a difference. So um, I know you're all acutely aware of that. Okay, so in case I forget, um, I, I, I just um, throw ideas out and talk with colleagues, getting ideas, but these are some of the people who've really done the work here. Um, I particularly wanted to mention uh, Frank Gunn Moore, who's the second person there. He's a neuroscientist. Um, he's been in uh, part of, um, he's got his own group in neuroscience, but he works with me. Uh, his wife's a vet. They actually discovered a form of Alzheimer's in cats. Actually, which is very interesting, but I can tell you about that maybe another time. But anyway, I'll come back to all these people um, who contribute to some of the end results that you'll see. So anyway, on to the science. What kind of things are we do? We can learn about all of these things. Well, nearly all of them. So, we do a lot of work in optical trapping. I will say a little bit about it in terms of complex light. That's the idea of using light to hold and move objects with beam shaping. So that's some work we did. I won't talk about that experiment in the top left. You can ask me how we got into the Guinness Book of World Records last year, if you are interested. These are two light fields that um, particularly intrigued me over the last 15 years and, uh, and are very exciting and interesting and have a lot of scope there. Are mainly the airy light field, which actually, uh, the airy light field is a Fourier transform of a cubic phase, for example. And the Bessel beam, which we've already kind of encountered in Collins lecture, you know from the airy disk. Um, and there's also other beams as well, so that's shaping in space. I'm also talking mostly about linear optics. It sounds very trivial just to make light beams with these patterns, but it, it turns out that they can have interesting propagation properties, either through tissue or in space. And also we can play in time as well, which I haven't discussed here on this slide just for obvious reasons. This is an example of complex media. I'll just run that video again. Oops. So that, that little white circle is a multi-mode fiber, $10 from Thor Labs. Now multi-mode fiber uh, is sent, used to send broadband to the home. It actually gives you a speckle pattern, but it's not giving you a speckle pattern, there. it's giving you a raise of spots with no lenses attached. Why well, you want to do that, I will come on to that. Um, and that allows you to move objects, we can do a whole lot more as we'll see. The reason you might want to use that is a multi-mode fibre is one-tenth of the diameter of an equivalent fibre bundle that you might use for endoscopy. And therefore one hundredth of the area. And this is some example of light sheet imaging using beam shaping. So this is a zebrafish brain uh, with, uh, overexposed with membrane stained RFP. And you can see the structure that we're getting here compared to what one normally might get. And light sheet microscopy is currently one a very hot area. It's already been mentioned briefly, but it's something that I've got sort of, again, stumbled into, but it is very, very powerful, and I'll, I'll come on to that. But the main thing to take away is, it's simple, space, just shaping light in space and time. So this is how I'm going to break down the lectures. Um, I'm going to start with a lecture on Raman, which will mostly discuss things in space. Then I'll talk about complex beam shaping and go into the space domain. And there I'll um, show you how we do that, that work on the multi-mode fiber, for example. Then I'll go on to using the beam shaping, particularly in um, structural illumination or light, uh, basic light sheet, and time permitting, I'll show you how we got that image there of the zebrafish ray with low photo damage but much better resolution over a wide field of view. Now, as I guess alluded to in the previous talk, a lot of microscopy and imaging is a trade-off. And so you may have spatial constraints, temporal constraints, you may have issues with photo bleaching. So the, in my view, the right way to approach the problem is to ask yourself, what is the question I need to answer and what resolution do I need? There's no point in getting a system that gets you 10 nanometer resolution if 100 nanometers will suffice you. 
If your fluorophore um, photo bleaches very quickly, if you don't have the right laser, if you don't, what depth do you need in that? So you need to formulate a question and then think of the science to answer it. The other thing is, you've got a wonderful set of lectures here, and you'll probably get bamboozled. Biophotonics has more acronyms than any other field I've ever seen. But the principles aren't all that different, actually. They're really quite simple. To so keep the print anchored in the principles rather than should I use OCT or OCM or DHM or whatever it is versus, you know, you can go, you can get a head in a tears, but ask yourself, what do I want to measure? What is the scale level? What is the size? What, you know, those questions, and then fit the science around them. What science fits what your prescript, your art question? Okay? Right. Why is light good? It's surprising, isn't it, that light's actually any good at all for doing bio, in my, in my view. If I had a laser pointer, I pointed at my finger, my, my tip of my finger would glow and it wouldn't go anywhere. But it turns out, of course, with the drive in re um, resolution, which now goes into the super resolution, and also the other scale into OCT that you hear about, um, combined with the ubiquity of laser sources, they're, they're really essentially expensive in many ways, um, especially if you avoid say, pulse lasers, we can do a lot. And it also turns out a lot of diseases originate in the epithelium. So, for example, you can detect disease in the skin or the esophagus or your colon or plenty <laughs> fiber optics. So light has perhaps surprised all of us and that we're still here in a room like this in 2016, sitting and talking about amazing advances and agenda setting with something that frankly does not go very deep. Okay, because frankly, you know, you think about how deep ultrasound goes or other um, parts of electromagnetic spectrum, it's surprising light's being so competitive. It's great, it's great for all of you, it's great for us. Okay, because it's all in business. So, this is my quick view of the whole world of imaging. Uh, so there's the world, world of resolution on the left-hand side. There's um, the optical domain, and as we've all seen, um, including uh, Collins, uh, who likes to set, up, set me up for this, that what's happening is optics is trying to get a little, um, it's trying to muscle in on the two areas in the top left, the top right and bottom left, right? It's, it's displacing electron microscopy. I'll show you an example of where we've used SIM to replace electron microscopy in the coming lecture. And of course, we're going to hear about OCT. These are not all of the methods. It's just it would just get too, um, too cluttered. But the idea is we really want to go down here. And that would be really great, right? So we can go, go somewhere down here. I'm not sure. Maybe some people could say they can do it to some extent. And they're great questions. Um, you may have your question. One of the questions driven by my collaborators, particularly is neuroscience, understanding single synapses right across the whole brain. Okay, whole brain functional imaging. Okay? Understanding plasticity. That's the kind of thing where you need to look at the very small across the very big. If I stimulate this synapse, what happens to this cell at the other side of this brain? How is memory formed? Those kind of questions can only be answered if we can have levels of scale. And so that's another thing light will find pretty challenging to address, but you know, it's, uh, it's doing some very exciting things. So let's start with Raman, because Raman is also, Raman actually, you can do, I won't have time to talk about it, but structured illumination has been applied by Kawata's group to Raman spectroscopy in the last year. And Raman also has been applied with light sheet geometry. So Raman is something that I'm going to start with because it gets us going in space and time, but also I'm going to talk about time here a little bit more than Normal. Now, in the spirit of a lecture, I'm just going to give you a sort of very basic introduction. We can get, and try and avoid much of the mathematics. Well, I want to just go away with principles as to why Raman is good. So Raman is really molecular information. Okay? It's not phase information. It's not like OCT where you might pick up delta N differences or morphological changes. It's molecules. Okay? And what happens is, um, you can just about see this little cartoon I've made. Light shines on a molecule and it scatters. And it can scatter elastically, okay? All right, some kind of rally scattering kind of idea. Or it can scatter inelastically, all right? And if it scatters inelastically, then the light, if you like, shifts a little bit in energy. That's really it. And that shift in energy is not as pronounced as my little drawing there where you can by eye see the shift. It can be, but it actually can be very subtle. And you can see, depending on the vibrational, rotational modes of the molecule of interest, that shift should change. And each of, those, each of those vibrations and oscillations would therefore lead me to, if you like, a different shift in energy. So I plot that here in what's called wave number, cm to the minus one, 
tens of gigahertz, 30 gigahertz is 1 cm to the minus 1, and I'll have a y-axis here. And that's Raman, C.V. Raman, who um, won the Nobel Prize for this in 1930, and picked up the idea of Raman scattering looking at on a cruise to the Mediterranean, and uh, before he went back and did some theory on this. And in fact, he was so sure he was going to win the Nobel Prize, in fact, in 1928 and 29, he'd already bought a plane ticket to Stockholm. So there's no easy jet or riot in there, but he, he sort of bagged on getting a phone call or, or telegraph. Of course, God knows what happened in those days when they communicated it. So he was a, bit, a little bit annoyed for a couple of years until 1930 he got the call or the letter that he was, he was hoping for. Raman has survived, as many of you know, it's widely used in material science. There's companies making money. In biomedicine, it's one of these things that's always teetering on the brink. Okay, it's teetering. And it's teetering on the brink for a number of reasons. I won't be able to go into that in all detail, but I'll just show you some examples of what, that, what happens. What is Raman, rather than just looking at the scattering? It's really, in, in some ways, if you like, a quantum process like all of these. But the point is that you have normal fluorescence. So this is my, like, my Du Bois diagram. I have an excitation. And then I may have a fluorescence. So if I'm exciting a fluorophore. But I also have... For example, possibility of scattering of a virtual state. So it's very quick. Right? It's like kind of an instantaneous kick. So you can see here, one thing I want you to look at in the time domain, this can take a little bit of time. The, the, if you like, the molecule rattles around in the upper states before it decays. Whereas Raman is essentially instantaneous coming off a virtual state. And then come off either um, a Stokes or anti Stokes shift. What does that mean? Very simply for today, it just means whether the molecule is in its ground state or first excited state. If it's in the ground state, here, it'll go up, and it'll come back to a slightly higher state. And that deficit in energy, a little deficit, is what's carried over and gives you a beautiful peak in my Raman signature. And that's the Stokes sign, which we normally look at. So if you excite with near-infrared light, that's why the Raman signal is at longer wavelengths. Okay? Now, if we go to the anti-Stokes, if we were to excite, there will, of course, be some molecules in the slightly higher state, then we'd actually pick up like blue scatter or photons that actually have a little bit more energy. Most people don't pick that up because it's a lot weaker. We don't normally have too many molecules in these states, but that's also what you can pick up there. Mm -hmm. In fact, interestingly, the ratio of these can give you some indication of the temperature, in fact, of your system, uh, for those of you who know a little bit more about that. And so, if you do that, this is what you might get. This is the same diagram. There's my Raman excitation. And then I might have a Stokes or an anti-Stokes. I plotted that in frequency space rather than wavelength. But you get the idea. So if I shine light on something, the light will come off. And if I shine, say, shine 785 nanometers, which is a typical popular wavelength for Raman, all my light, all my scattered light, my Raman peaks, my Stokes line will be somewhere between 785 up to a micron or so, depending on my molecular system. Now this is great, and it is also therefore a chemical fingerprint of what I'm looking at. Now why don't we use Raman and use this all the time? Well, it's because it turns out those processes, if you look at them, only 1 in 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 8 photons is Raman scattered. That means it's very, very weak. And it's not the only thing happening in that diagram. There's fluorescence. There may be phosphorescence. There may be other processes going on. So you're really going to be in trouble if you're just relying on a Raman signal, which is why, and I won't have time to go into this, people are looking at enhancing Raman signals through surface enhancement and so forth, which is powerful, but also perhaps is plagued by reproducibility. People still argue today about what's the best substrate to enhance Raman signals or do that. But Raman in its native state is still very, very popular. As Colin has already alluded to, you can do this in a, um, you can do this, the optics is essentially the same as a microscope. The only difference is you'll need a spectrometer because we're going to have to collect a signal that's spectrally dispersed from the excitation beam. And so here's an example of what we might do. You can have confocal Raman or you can have, have an aperture. And instead of going to a CCD camera or point detector, I need to collect a spectrum. I need to collect all those lines, my chemical fingerprint coming on. And that's the kind of geometry that one might use. And these uh, numbers were already shown by Colin, I think. It is. So there's nothing new in the optics there or the imaging side that you need to concern yourself with. What about the signal? Well, you detect that, for example, using a spectrometer. And you may also need a degree of cooling, because it's a very weak process, and so many people use cooled CCD cameras, liquid nitrogen cooled cameras. And very simply, you disperse that line on the grating, 
and then you collect that. And you collect that signal, and then you've got a feature for what's actually happening. Okay? So that's the kind of thing you can do. You can do more advanced things with line, excitation for Raman and so forth, but that gives you the basics of what one might need. So usually near infrared light being in the therapeutic window. Raman scattering typically goes as one over lambda to the four. So if I go from 1064 to 532 nanometers, I'll get a factor of 16 improvement, but the problem is um, 532 is a little bit more harmful to cells than 1064. So people stick to around 780 near infrared wavelengths to make it basically safe for biomedical specimens. So these are the kinds of things you might need to think about. Spectrometer focal length, the groove density of your diffraction grating, depending on where you want to see um, what, you're, what, what in information you're getting. The laser wavelength matters. Many Raman systems use 785, but you can buy Raman systems down to the blue, 488, or even longer. So the wavelength should be dictated by your application and time constraints. And your camera, well, there again, you can maybe even use EMCCDs if you don't want to use liquid cooled uh, um, cameras instead. And resolution, of course, depends on your pixels and what you have. That's the kind of system you have for Raman. So just looking at that, you've got a simple laser and a telescope focusing the light beam down. We might look at the sample using a simple CCD. And then the light comes back. So it's an epigeometry, we excite, and usually typically collect through the same jet. You don't need to. You can do some more things, as we'll see later. And then you might collect on a spectrometer, which is that device on the left. That's where we have the confocal image. And you have this green uh, plate called, uh, labeled NF, which is a notch filter. Why is that? Because we're going to get a strong elastically scattered component, the Rayleigh component. So the light coming back at 785, so if I shine the laser, some of that laser light is going to come straight back at me. I need to get rid of that. So this is like a very nice narrow line filter that will basically reflect the laser light in, but on the way back it will just allow transmission of my Raman features without me having to discern them from the um, laser excitation that it happens itself. And that's what you have. So that's an example. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about where we wiggle the laser wavelength. So this is a very simple trick, but it's proved amazingly powerful. Um, it was actually commercialized now this year um, of something that we did here. But I'll just tell you about um, what you would do for that. The numerical aperture and all the optical considerations are the same as Colin delineated earlier, depending on what axial and spatial resolution you want. So the volume of excitation matters, though, quite heavily in Raman. So rather like, unlike sectioning, you might want to worry about, if you like, how much, how much of the sample you really have and interact with. So a lot of people in Raman might not use the highest numerical aperture optics unless they're taking signals from single cells rather than taking signals from simple biopsy. So a lot of people are working in this area. This is so um, for students. There's a big, big area of endoscopic Raman using this to actually discern tissues. If you're interested, this is a very recent review paper by Nick Stone's group. Nick Stone is now at Exeter and has worked very nicely with Gloucester NHS Trust. Um, I'd recommend this paper. It's very nice. It gives a very good overview of what's happening in the field. And it also talks about some of the applications where you use exactly what I've shown, but rather than using um, free space optics, we might go to fiber optics. And here in fiber optics, you need to worry about the Raman spectra of silica. So the very fiber, the very optics used to deliver the light, everything gives you a Raman signal. That's the problem. It's a, it's a blessing and a curse. So if you want to take a Raman signal of your sample, you might be taking something of your cover slip, your index oil, uh, the fiber optics you use, who knows? So you have to discern that, and, these, and they talk about this um, in, this, in, this, um, in this paper here. And there's several papers here by, for example, Jürgen Pop's group and also Nick Stone's group looking at new fiber optic geometries um, that actually um, try to overcome this. Okay? Now, these are the kinds of systems that you might have. You might have coupling, so we have a source slide and detector, and then going off to a fiber uh, spectrograph. Fiber Raman is usually basically a single mode fiber that mainly delivers the light with collection fibers around its periphery. So that will be my little fiber bundle, and that's what you have. This goes back to the group in Germany here from 2003 showing you that, and there's many companies now that sell that. Um, 
And these, these, this is where, for example, you might have a kind of notch filter where they're trying to block light from the fibre itself. What do these look like? This is an example of an infotonics probe. I'm not promoting any probe, but it's a famous company that does them. How you might design that. So you can see here that they managed to uh, cram a lot of really cute optics into a very small space. That's very, very important. If we're going to get, take Raman or even any vibrational spectroscopies in the clinic, fibers like these are, uh, geometries are going to be very, very important. So again, the bandpass filter here removes the silicon from the excitation. And then we've got a long pass filter rejecting uh, the rally light. And so here's an example of a spectra. This is cheating, of course, using something like naphthalene, nothing biological. But you can see that a normal fiber bundle would give you this horrible big background fluorescence that you'd have, whereas using this kind of geometry, you can get beautiful baselining nearly down to zero. So there's amazing advances in these probes, and they definitely are being used to look at um, many exciting types of uh, disease. Um, now, one thing that a lot of people say is, what are we looking at in Raman though? If I give you two cells, and I tell you, one cell is healthy and this one's neoplastic, it's starting to become cancerous or some disease is developing. Well, as a physicist you say, well, they're like two balloons with the same molecules in them. Why on earth should cell A be different from cell B? It's a good question, right? What am I actually picking up in Raman? I'm just shining light, there's no labels, and light's coming back. It's the same molecules, isn't it? It's the same cell in your body, but why is this one cancerous and this one not? Or this one people label as diseased or, or abnormal or whatever, and this one isn't. What happens is it's all obviously down to genes being expressed and biological processes. So all our cells basically, we're, we're, we're out of equilibrium, life is out of equilibrium. Our genes are being expressed, so um, we've got DNA created, other processes going on. So what happens is there's very subtle little differences. So it's essentially the same spectra as you can see here, but the amazingly subtle little differences that occur where you get up and down regulation of genetic processes inside each cell, which then people correlate with the onset of disease. So that's actually what happens. Okay? Um, so, for example, you know, histones that... Um, maintain a DNA wound state might change in a cancerous cell, for example, the signal from lipids or amino acids, um, these endogenous molecules can change and you need to pick these up. So at first glance, this also seems really hard. So now I've told you, it's very weak, I've got a big background, and I'm looking for unbelievably subtle changes in two spectra that to the naked eye look essentially identical. Okay? So that makes things sound very, very tough in terms of the biomedical community, if I'm doing that. So, how do we do this? So, I'm just going to put this up. It's, uh, so, many of you will have heard of multivariate statistical analysis. I'm not going to explain to you what PCA is. PCA is amazing. And it's basically transposing um, these spectra in these instances into an eigenvector eigenvalue problem. You know, if you've, come, if you've flown here, you've gone through an airport, you're in Heathrow, they take a picture of you. How do they do that? They don't have a database of six billion people. What they do is they have eigenfaces, in fact. What they do is they actually have mapped faces that, if you like, transpose human images into an eigenvector eigenvalue problem. And then that's how they quickly do identification before you, as you click your boarding pass and you jump on a plane. This is used everywhere. So I'm not going to labor it, but I can talk about it later. This is a very quick example. So here we have two data sets, and they essentially gave me the same mean. So you can see that. I've just picked four silly numbers, all right? And then I pick a standard deviation and a variance. Okay? Why? Well, trivial. You all knew this before you even entered university, right? That's great. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to correlate data not just in its own set, but across sets. So, for example, let's say I try to correlate the height of everybody in the room by um, how many papers everybody read each night this week. Alright? So there might be a correlation between these two. I don't think so. I don't know. Alright? Maybe you're not going to read any papers. Some of you might read 100 papers this week. Inspired by the lectures, I don't know. There won't be a correlation between the two. But what the, um, what the covariance matrix does is it takes those two kinds of data sets and says, is there some kind of correlation between them? How does it do that? Instead of having a variance where you just take one variable x, you take two variables y, x and y, and you try to look for patterns between the two. And you build up what's called a covariance matrix. And as you do that, you turn that into what's called an eigenvector eigenvalue problem, where the 
top component there tells you the biggest variance or the biggest change in that data set. So it's rather like rotating data sets that correlate, say, height and number of papers you might read, or number of beers you drink versus how many times you saw tomorrow in this week. It could be any data set you want. It could take all of those, and I could actually correlate all of that. And that's how you do that. So this is a beautiful way to do that. And uh, Carl Pearson came up with this in 1905. <coughs> it's been around. Now, let me tell you, I think PCA is one of the most amazing things in the world. I really think so. We would not believe what we use it for. I'm going to show you an amazing example of what we use Raman and fluorescence and PCA for at the end of this talk. But I think it's an incredibly powerful route. So have a, have a little think about that and what you can do. And here, for example, with that data set, I've um, averaged it and then I've taken the mean there, and then I've plotted the original PCA data here, but I've taken actually that data set I just showed you, and I've plotted it to look at the covariance matrix here and the eigenvalues. And you see, I can if you like, reorient that data to say there's a trend, say for example, looking at some correlation here, and you can see that uh, in this simple diagram that I've got. Anyway, if you're not into it, don't worry, but what it does allow me to do is take data sets that are very close and look for the maximal variances. So each of the other, each of the um, principal components tells me the biggest change. Now it turns out if you do Raman, probably your biggest change is going to be the fluorescence. So PC1 picks up the fluorescence. Then it might be something like the histones, perhaps. Then it might be the lipids. And so then it goes down and picks up all those subtle differences without you having to scrutinize the data. So it's very, very robust and very nice and reproducible. So there we go. That's uh, me rotating <coughs> data sets to do that for these two components. All right, in, from a Raman spectrum. And then what do you do? It's actually used in voice recognition as well. And then what you do is you do um, a training set. So Raman doesn't immediately know that it cells cancerous. What you do is you usually train on a piece of tissue or, or cells that are healthy, and you get a data set. And then what you do is then take cells that you don't know, and you build up what we call a confusion matrix. Hopefully that's not what you are right now. The confusion matrix tells me how many times I thought I had a healthy cell, and I really detected that. And of course, many of you will know that's linked to things like sensitivity and specificity, which is really what the information that you need if you're taking this into the clinical environment. So that's how you might actually um, assign all this Raman data uh, in, the, in the lab. Now let me show you some um, physics in shaping in space. So here, for example, We've got our Raman, but we've got that big fluorescent background. Remember the fiber probe? Remember that massive signal that we had? So here we have a real kind of Raman spectra. And usually, you see those two little blips, that's the Raman spectra that you have, and usually they have a massive fluorescence background. Now, there are many ways that you can actually um, remove that. I could use a mathematical analysis. Now, if I all gave you, everybody a computer, and a piece of software, you could all go away and work out a curve that might fit some random fluorescence background. Okay? It turns out that there will be some statistical variation between the number that you pick. And also, when you have this, your fit might, be, might change depending on the relative weighting of the Raman signal you have. So you might have to be a little careful with that. You can use time resolution. Why? Well, do you remember that Raman was an excitation to a virtual state and then instantaneously the photon mm -hmm. came out? But what happened with fluorescence? Goes up to the higher vibrational level, rattles around due to vibration, takes you know, a little bit of time. So if I use time gating, I can get out the Raman signal without the fluorescence. But that means I might need something like a non Kerr gating is used, for example, Kerr nonlinearity. I could do that. You can use some Trevor tricks with polarization, or you can use multiple wavelengths. So I'm going to show you how that works now. So this is it's a, simple, it's a very simple idea. So instead of keeping the laser beam fixed in time, what if I just wiggle the laser beam back and forth? Like this. Now let me take another. This, so that's my excitation, that's my Raman feature, okay? So if I do that, that's what's going to happen. Pretty boring. Okay? But as I do that and I wiggle, if I wiggle the laser just gently or move it only a small distance in wavelength, the fluorescence background essentially is going to stay constant. So what's going to happen is I'm going to have a little wiggly peak juddering on top of a very big, huge fluorescence background. Now it turns out, if I look at principal components analysis, it picks up the maximal variation between any two spectra. So not too surprisingly, without even any calibration, if you'd wiggled the laser wavelength, 
PCA1 immediately picks out the Raman's mix and re rejects all the fluorescence just because that's the maximal variation that you'll see between those two groups. So that's an example of um, something we and other groups have also used variants of this. And if you do that, you get a beautiful derivative signal. This is very, very nice and powerful, and it's only just been used by quite, quite a few groups now using this, or variants of this. We've actually done this on paper microfluidics. This is work on immune cells. And, it, and if you're in atomic spectroscopy, which I imagine virtually nobody here is, many of you will know this kind of idea is used for laser stabilization because we would love a derivative signal. That kind of signal is very powerful, actually, in laser stabilization, where you need a derivative to lock to or stabilize a laser to. So that, in other words, if there's a shift in wavelength, you get a signal basically that's proportional, if you like, to the displacement you have in laser wavelength from a locking point. And that's what you might see. So here's an example of what one might get. So here's a, a, a Chinese hamster ovary cell. So there's the cytoplasm, membrane, and nucleus, and there's the background. You can see it's quite big. If you modulate the signal, for example, and wiggle it around, you can see we get basically a near flat line. And this doesn't mean I'm actually doing any mathematics. I'm actually extracting the Raman signal from any background very, very simply. So shifting in time makes a huge difference. If you do a comparison of this, you can do a beautiful comparison of this data, this kind of idea, with stand so that's standard Raman. This is a polystyrene bead, for example. That's SERS. SERS is just using two wavelengths. So I say, here's wavelength one, here's wavelength two. Wavelength one, wavelength two. You can go home and do this with just a two laser wavelength. It actually makes a huge difference. But it turns out, these are numerical analyses, if you do more than one wavelength, modulate it, you basically amplify the signal-to-noise ratio. And you get a factor of, well, 5 to 10, depending on your signal. So that's actually also very good, because you're, one of the problems when you're only detecting 1 in 10 to 6 or 10 to the 8 photons is, in fact, how do you get that signal out? It's very, very weak. So in fact, you can reduce acquisition time here by maybe a factor of 2 to 5, depending on your sample, using that kind of approach. Now, as you do this, you can look at signal-to-noise in Raman, and as you do that, then you can do an uh, analysis of all these methods. And here, as we move the frequency of juggling, okay, we get a peak around about number two, so in the middle here, which seems an optimum for this particular sample, which I don't know off the top of my head which one it was. Um, and you'll get that for any peak, and that makes sense, because you have to dwell on the sample long enough to get some Raman photons out. As Colin was alluded to, a signal is very important. But really, what matters is signal to noise. Right? Signal to noise. You have some background, but you need to extract enough signal for Raman or whatever you're doing before you can actually move on to the next point. And if you do that, you find here that we have an optimum trade-off between how quickly you go you can go and what method they use. But it's a it's an interesting sort of challenge to work those out. So the proof of the pudding is how that principal component idea, remember making that covariance matrix and making it an eigenvector eigenvalue problem works. So here, for example, we go back to the Cho cell. You can see here we've got the principal components ordered um, in this graph. And you can see here, um, the color scheme isn't perhaps ideal, but if you use the fluorescence, you get a little bit of just overlap between the cytoplasm nucleus and the membrane, whereas if you use some kind of modulation scheme to suppress that fluorescence, you can easily discriminate. That's very, very important um, to be able to do. So here, um, this is a work with Jürgen Popsgrew, you can actually take Raman with the lights on. Now if you go to, we can all go back to our laboratories and do beautiful optics experiments, but if you go to a clinic and you say, well, we need a big curtain, we need an optical table, we need to float it, uh, the clinician is probably going to say, <laughs> no, I'll better get back to using what I have. So, in fact, because of the modulation, you can actually take Raman signals from a probe with the lights on. That's actually quite practically useful. Okay, that's actually very, very useful. If you're taking, doing, having a biopsy done on your hand or in your body, that's the kind of way that the signal should be taken in a real clinical setting. So these kinds of ideas have real benefit that one can do. And, um, I won't go into all the data, so this is both for um, 
tissue and also for um, the pharmaceutical industry, which uh, produces this idea. <clears throat> There's other examples. Um, this is just um, an example showing uh, work with a local hospital looking at um, these breathing modes of DNA which become more prominent. Remember I said there's changes in the DNA structure that you have in protein peaks and the improvement here is seen in the sensitivity and specificity. So that's my diagonal confusion matrix. How many times I think I've got this cell when I really have that cell? And as you can see, you can get a, a reasonable improvement in sensitivity and specificity which is exactly what you want. And so that's the kind of thing that one could actually do. This was applied to bladder cancer which is which is that, um, quite a high, um, serious form of cancer, certainly in the UK and worldwide. But it's also very much accessible to photonics because we have urine samples and we can spin down cells from that quite easily. And so that's just the, the PCA analysis for that. So, Raman need not be in a free space system or in a fiber based system. But some of you may also be working on microfluidics or on chip Raman, where we develop point of care devices. It's not just Raman, you can do lots of things, fluorescence, cars, microscopy, anything, on a chip. And so um, these chips can be applied to bodily fluids and also can be applied even to things like food and drink. So, um, what I'm going to do is to tell you a little bit about an example of a chip one could make to make ramen very, very simple um, and usable. And so this is the chip here. It's the size of a credit card, or actually half a credit card, and it doesn't actually use any lenses. It just has an excitation fiber and a collection fiber that are kept very short and designed so that we minimize any background fluorescence. Now, that also leads to um, some of the ideas that Colin was mentioning, which is the um, the configuration. So this is the one we've looked at mostly, where the light comes in, goes into the sample, then comes back out again. We could, of course, go through the sample, but due to thick samples and multiple scattering, that's usually not very sensible or very pragmatic. Or you can look in an ortho orthogonal geometry, rather like the little uh, slide he showed from, I think, 1940, where they were looking, I think, more like 45 degrees. These geometries, rather than also like light sheet, you know, coming in at a, a non uh, 90 degrees or so can make a lot of difference, and that's what this chip, for example, seems to do for Raman. So you can do lots of interesting things. You can do some chemistry. So this is an example of this chip, and there's many chips now that can do this kind of thing. This is look, looking at little droplets. There's oil and water droplets that can actually encapsulate cells and drugs and take Raman signals. This is just actually ethanol and... and um, silicone oil, and the idea is people can encapsulate cells and have them going around in a little chemistry lab on your chip. You can take a Raman signal and move on, so that's actually quite nice. And there's actually several companies that are now starting up looking at droplet microfluidics where they actually encapsulate cells and drugs on chip and move them around for spectral analysis. And you, can, you can see the idea there that one might do. This is a paper from 220. Yeah. And uh, you consider there's a small amount of material. Uh, so our hypothesis would be the same compared to, you know, to the no. thing. And then how <laughs> this uh, Raman signature is you know, helpful to for quantitative characterization of the changes. Yeah, sure. So that's a great question. So um, on these small droplets, you're only going to encapsulate small numbers of cells or even individual cells. But people in single cell proteomics see the value of single cell analysis for different reasons. But it does not answer the same question as, I need a biopsy of a millimeter of my skin. But if you take a biopsy, you may wish to, if you've isolated some cells, do further analysis on chip with some of those, for example. So they, if you like complementary, you're absolutely right. They're not really going to answer a more global question of, do I have cancer or do I... Um, that's maybe where the probe would work better. This is more for smaller numbers of cells, or maybe doing little blood analysis, for example, um, or glucose sensing. I haven't got time to talk about all these, but as you know, many people are using Raman as well for blood sensing and glucose sensing, potentially on chip, but it's all possible. And if it's encapsulated, it means you can do multiple stations. If it's in a droplet, you can do Raman here, maybe do fluorescence here, maybe do something else downstream. 
And that's the excitement of what might, one might do on these kinds of devices um, without having um, the constraint of, you know, just having things clogging up as well. So that's, that's where people are getting um, quite interested. There's several companies now that set up to try and do these things. So we took a chip like this, and for example, you can do urea detection. Urea is quite interesting, and you can detect down to physiological levels quite well. And using the modulation, you do get a reduction, uh, well, an improvement in the signal-to-noise ratio, which means you can actually see some very, very nice things um, in that. And so there you have an example of the modulated versus standard Raman signal. But you can do other things. So one evening after coming home from a, uh, a working dinner with, with an advisory board who were trying to encourage me to do different things with some of our technology, I walked past a little off-license in St Andrews and it's in Scotland we, we always uh, put our whiskey up against a white background so you can all see the colour. Right? And maybe you do this if you're going to duty free. And then I went home and I thought, I wonder what is the Raman spectrum of whiskey? Interesting question. Okay, and I thought I can actually tell the difference between different whiskies uh, with my eye. And I'm, I'm not going to look forward to being an expert of Irish whiskey, but we have in Scotland we have peaty whiskies from the west, and sort of um, lowland whiskies that are a little bit thinner and different and lighter in colour. And so we went back and we just took Raman spectra of whiskey with that little chip. So we used a teardrop of whiskey um, in this little chip, like so. And then we just did principal component analysis. So here three whiskies, and you can see they cluster completely differently. Now here I should point out, we include the fluorescency. Okay, so we're not blocking the fluorescent signal here. Okay. So um, what I'm about to show you is now, yeah. Just a very short conceptual question, because I like to think in nanometers, when you show the spectrums on Raman shift, yeah. this is relative to the excitation you have in that? Correct. It's and cm to the minus 1. 1 cm to the uh, minus 1 is 30 gigahertz. So what about the nanometer? I feel like we have 2,000 cm to the minus 1. Right, so I could work that out for you. So if you convert uh, 30 gigahertz, is, it's, it's several, it's, okay, so the Raman spectrum could go over tens to hundreds of nanometers. Okay. All right, it's quite big. Okay. All right, and it depends on what grating you use, as I showed at the beginning, what one you use. Okay, but most chemists use this scale, which is why you always see. But one cm to the minus one is 30 gigahertz, and you can then just convert that as you want into uh, wavelength. Um, yeah, but I do think in uh, wavelength as well. But it, from the chemistry point of view, always Raman spectra are plotted in this scale here. Now, I won't show you all the data, but we've actually made a cloud database now for about 100 whiskies that you can detect on a handheld device with this, I'm just going to show you, so it's not just three whiskies that I chose that were completely different by eye, but the interesting thing is you could do a chemometric analysis. Here it's picking up, for example, Glenn Fidditch, which is 12, 15, and 18 year old. So you can actually pick up the um, whiskey from which age it is. Let me tell you, if you buy a 10 year old whiskey, let's say today in Duty Free, and you buy the same brand in a year's time, and the 10, it will be different. It's going from a different cast. Also, um, more importantly for this audience, it also picks up toxicity. So some of you may know, for example, in the Czech Republic a few years ago, there was an incident where Slivovica, which is a plum brandy, was taken, and some miners sadly died, and then the Czech government had to basically clear the shells of uh, a lot of alcohol where they decided how to deal with that. If you go to India, rural India, hundreds of people a month die from drinking uh, tainted alcohol in one form or another, and I won't, due to time, go into that, but the, this signal can actually pick up the methanol content of whiskey below the EU level between 0.01%. We all worry more about what we eat and drink, and that affects our health as well. So a lot of the biophotonics procedures can actually be applied in uh, areas that uh, you might not uh, first think are the ones to go for. And we don't do this in a chip anymore, but it was, this is a brilliant way of me justifying buying whiskey on a research ground. It's just fantastic and easy, uh, only 10 microliters, and we have bottles of whiskey lying around in the lab. And, uh, yep. uh, do you need just two eigenvectors to detect all of it? So the question is, do I need eigenvector, or you mean principal yes. component analysis? Um, usually yes, it, it usually improves the discrimination. If it's whiskies that are very different in color, 
you could probably use something very simple to do it. But then you could probably use your eye or something much simpler to do it. So you just selected the two of them, analyzing the eight values, or you just said, okay, we're taking two, and we, uh, let's see if we can separate them just using two components. No, okay, so what, what we do is we, we take, let's say you, you give us a, we, we train the system on all the whiskey. So we might take 50 to 100 spectra of each whiskey that we want, mm -hmm. and we build up a database, all right? And so we know where in the database this will come. So these are all the same whiskey and they're clustered. Now the reason they spread is because just like any optics, if I take the reading now in this warm room and then I go outside and take a reading, it'll be different. All right, so we train the machine to look for environmental changes. So, you know, and it also, in fact, we have a system now that you can train the machine immediately before you do a test. So we don't just say we want to change this whiskey versus, it's very rarely that. What people normally want to do is say, uh, someone's just bought a 25-year-old X. Is it really a 25-year-old Bushmills or <laughs> Oban or Lafroy or whatever it is? Is it really that? That's usually the question. So the question is, that's the question the industry wants to answer. Does that, does that answer your yeah. question? So it turns out that the, um, the ramen actually also tells you the alcohol content. In Scotland, you cannot sell whiskey unless it's 40% alcohol and has been in a barrel for three years and it's got all these regulations. I remember the Isle of Man were going to make some whiskey a few years ago. They were booted out of the whiskey cap for these reasons. So it actually helps in quality control and health. So but this is, it doesn't have to be whiskey. I'm just trying to show you how powerful these amazing multivariate techniques are. And this is a real world solution that's now come to market uh, from us. And now people are wanting to do it through the bottle. So you can go to duty free and just point it at a glass. There's, that's other, there's other problems there because the glass is going to be different and it's, it's maybe uh, a little bit too hard to be as, as realistic. But this is, this is very, very exciting to do uh, for us. So there's the uh, alcohol content. So you can, we could actually measure it to 1% even if it's on 50 samples. And that's very, very important. And that's where that led on to the toxicity study, which due to time, I'm not going to uh, show you, but I'm very happy to show you that later. But what I am going to show you is this. So he's loading our chip, we trained him to do that. <laughs> Very stressful day. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine going back to my lab and getting that to work, but in an audience like, if you've ever been in a TV studio, there's hundreds of people, big cables, bright lights, and we had to train that guy to load the chip. It was so stressful. And, uh, thankfully, it worked. But Dara Bryan, as many of you know, he's a very, very famous guy. Um, he's actually an astrophysicist by training, and but he loves science, and he's also a really great comedian, so he's a great ambassador. For science, but when he heard about it, I think he said, brilliant, I can drink whiskey on live TV, so bring, <laughs> bring it on. <laughs> what happened to B and C? <laughs> <laughs> he, just, he just went for that one, so that's what oh. he went for. But yeah, yeah so he, we had three whiskeys. In fact, the BBC, of one. Yeah. yeah, that's right. The BBC also made us buy a cooking whiskey, which I didn't even know existed until yeah. I went there. So in fact, there are whiskeys, you can, I'm not going to advocate you go down the supermarket now, do you? You can buy, just like cooking wine, you can buy a whiskey and if you just want to put in cakes. But he wouldn't drink it neat because it tastes a little bit vile, but it's brilliant as a little uh, something in your bake, home baking, maybe a bake off show or something, but we had something. And they wanted to ruin our system and said, what, it won't it work? And I said, well, if you buy a whiskey we're not trained on, right, it, well, computer won't know what it is, right? It will just randomly allocate it where it thinks is the closest PC component. So they bought some horrible cheap stuff, which I think was under sea in this one. <laughs> Dara didn't go for that. He said, I'm going to drink the nice one, so it's much as a Anyway, I, um, I think that's, uh, yeah, so I'm going to start with that. I hope in the last hour I've given you some basic principles about ramen and fluorescence. You've understood how weak ramen can be, but it's also very, very powerful. What does a ramen signal tell us? How we record it, how we might use it, and some of the challenges that remain to take ramen from what is um, a really exciting and very fundamental method. It doesn't apply just to ramen. There's 
other things such as stimulated ramen scattering or cars and take that towards the clinic or maybe even into the food and drink industry. So I'll stop there and happily take questions. Thank you. I hope you brought your whiskey detector with you because there's, um, there's a pub just there around. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's about 160 different whiskeys and a very long menu. So, uh, um, and it's interesting you said that 40% because there's a long story about that. But, uh, we'll, we'll probably have to be down there to discuss it. Uh, any questions of a scientific nature? <laughs> So the, the chips that you showed us, do they use a vanus index excitation or is it no. uh, actually in, uh, no. it goes through the, the, the Yeah, the so uh, let me just go back to a picture of one just to, uh, uh, let's just go that one. It's two pieces of glass, this is a soft elastomer known as PDMS, yeah. and it's two fibres that come in and, it's, and the liquid just flows like this and it's excitation this way and collection that way. So does your channel itself act as your waveguide then? Yeah. So we just mill a 100 right. micron channel unit. Yeah, right. You can do what you like. This is just one we've used, and it was one we used for blood testing that we use for whiskey. We don't actually use that device. I can show you. We have a little complete handheld device now for, for that kind of stuff. But for, for bodily fluids and, you know, in the biomedical industry, you want to use the minimum amount of that away, obviously. So that's yeah, why we developed it. Do you feel that balance and excitation is almost practical? Uh, because it is. the amount of interaction is lesser compared to a bulk uh, method like this. Yeah, so... We don't do any evanescent, and I know a lot of people do do evanescent wave sensing, but then you have to do modal excitation. You also only evanescent wave excitation, the evanescent wave decays only a couple of hundred yeah. nanometers from the surface. So here we probably have a bigger collection volume. I think evanescent waves are very good when you have antigen antibody binding onto surfaces, and things like the Kretschmann geometry, all right, yeah. for sensitivity. That may be a little bit of overkill for the whiskey or blood detection, in my view. But um, I'm sure someone will go out there is going to prove you wrong. As far as I recall, the the, um, the important parts have to be within about 15 nanometers yeah. of the surface for it, for that's right. evanescent waves to really that's interact right. with them. So that's that's, right. that could be an issue. It is. And actually, on another note, that also means, one thing that's never talked about is when you add an analyte, it's got to diffuse onto the surface. If you think of a little molecule, how long is it going to take a molecule to go in one millimeter? Just go and work it out from a square root 2 dt argument like an Einstein diffusion. It takes forever, you know, in buying. So it, they're beautiful in physics and they get amazing sensitivities and results, but you've got to ask yourself, in a real world application, is an evanescent wave sensitive? They're probably measuring the detergent, which is Exactly. Nice. There was another question here. Yes, Cushy. Um, you have used the PCA analysis, but did you, get, did you try some other maybe deep learning or... No. We, I, actually, we did on some of the data, I didn't go into so that's a great question. Let me just repeat the question. Did we use any further, more, more, in, more detailed multivariate analysis? So there's also um, LDA, for example, support vector machines. And what they do is, it, essentially, just for the audience, instead of having beautiful straight lines, they have be like curved lines instead of for boundaries. And in fact, on the whiskey, for example, a group at the Fraunhofer in Germany used support vector machines. And they got better discrimination than we did um, on things. You can do that, it's, it really comes down to your computational time and their expertise, but you're absolutely right, there's more you, you can go. I just wanted to show an example, but it's a great question. I think there was somebody else before you here. Um, yes, my, my question is that, as you say, it's quite difficult to get these ramen signals out in the first place, and when, and when you even get them out, they, they're often, as far as I know, quite complicated. Um, so isn't there quite a big challenge in getting it into uh, medicine applications sim simply because it's difficult to prove you have a, a right specificity because when you use these very complicated uh, statistical analysis it's difficult to say that you're actually measuring what you say you're measuring. It, it can be difficult to prove that you're right in a sense in a biological sense. Yeah, okay, so that, that, that's, a, that's a fair point. Um, to counter that, I would say I know at least a dozen hospitals, you know, particularly hospitals in Singapore, Gloucester, NHS, Trust, etc., that have used Raman. And you wouldn't, what, people, what doctors would do is benchmark it against some gold standard, depending on the disease they're, they're looking at. So they wouldn't just say, here's a Raman signal, and that must be cancer. They would actually do it and train it on biopsies that they already know at various stages. And that has been done by many groups, and I haven't had time to show all of that data, and people have done clinical trials. I think Raman would just be an extra piece of information in that instance. The other thing is you don't, though it sounds a little bit unscientific, you don't really need to know what the Raman's picking up, so long as you know it's a Raman signal. 
I'm not doing a scientific study to know that the DNA is wound less or more tightly in this cell versus that cell. All I really need to know is that these, this signature correlates with a cancerous or neoplastic state. And that's what a lot of the hospitals seem to do at the moment. Yeah, right. It's just recently uh, there's been a lot of discussions, as far as I know, about this. I mean, correlation is not the same as causation. So you sometimes end up in, in a situation where you, you have a correlation, but it doesn't actually necessarily tell you anything. No, that's true. And I think that longer trials need to be done and it needs to be benchmarked against other modalities. For example, um, I, I took these slides out, but we're doing Raman with OCT, for example. For, as another example, so where you actually use multimodality. So Raman, a lot of times, in disease won't be the only thing that you look at. It might be something that has value, and it may not have value. But I do know some hospitals where people, even though it's not published, they have patients actually use it now, um, which is very but, encouraging. But I'm not aware of anyone where it's approved, right? No, actual that's, that, no, okay, so Martin made a very good point. It's not, it, though it's being used, it's not approved. And that's, a, that's, a, that's a, an interesting question in its own right, a different one. In other words, if I take Raman signals and I tell everybody, if I do this, I can tell you that someone's got colon cancer to 90% in St. Andrews, it doesn't mean you'll use it here in Galway or you use it in London or Singapore or New York or wherever. Okay? And that's because we don't have standardization, we don't have the protocols, you know, and that's very hard to do. So what i found is that many hospitals use it ad hoc in their own little... Uh, with their local university and get great results and it does make a difference to patients locally but they can't farm it out in the way that you're suggesting that I send you that probe and everything. That's a very big challenge, not just for Raman, but lots of vitamin. Yeah, and, and there's also differences between this kind of Raman being used in tissue and, and that being used in you know, pure, let's say, white substances. And I think even in that, uh, I mean, certainly we have, we have a colleague in Galway who has a 30-page uh, document for how to take those samples out of the fridge. Physically, just taking it out of the fridge, and all of the parameters and the possible environmental things that could affect the signals you get. So, you know, the environmental factors, there are very many um, variables, and uh, I guess one of the criticisms of PCA, um, which I know you like a lot, but, but one of the criticisms would be that, uh, um, at least that I've heard, and I'm not in any way an expert in this area, is that, you know, you could fit various things. You can. You can over train it, you need you to be very careful with that. So yeah, that's true. You, you know, the, the classic thing that people say, you could fit an elephant, you know, <laughs> and maybe that's very much. There, Thomas had a question. Um, what, one, one comment on the question before was, and um, there's also written in PLS, so it's not, not only PCA you use. Oh, yeah, no, this is, yeah, <laughs> partial least squares yeah. analysis, yeah. Um, but that was for the alcohol content. Yes. Yeah, and another the question concerning the alcohol, um, or concerning the, the, the C column in the film, um, so the, C column, the, 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 the third whiskey that you um, mentioned in, 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 the, in, the, in the TV oh, show, right, yes. um, can you train your system that it uh, tells you, uh, I don't know this whiskey, I wouldn't drink it? <laughs> <laughs> we haven't gone that far. <laughs> So, well, because this would also be, be quite quite useful for for um, the, the problem also in medicine. If you um, if the computer would say, it would see, <laughs> wow, I'm not trained for this kind of person. I don't know. I can't tell you anything about this person. This would help there a lot. No, that's a good question. We've not gone that far. What we've done is trained for quite a lot of whiskies. We can differentiate them. But if an unknown one comes in at the moment, our algorithm would just try and assign it with some confidence mm -hmm. level to one that we have in our database. Which so you, maybe do get, you do get a confidence value out. Yeah, you can sort. say maybe it's yeah. low and then... Yeah, so you might have, it might be lower, but I think what you're saying is maybe certainly what we have, but maybe somebody else out there has something else. Like There's an old guy with a hat down the barber will tell you which one that to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a question, what kind of light source do you use for the yeah, so that's a great question. So how do you wiggle the wavelengths? So usually we use a laser diode. So if you want to just do serves with two wavelengths, you can probably buy two laser diodes, or you can even shift it in temperature. Just buy a cheap 785 laser diode and you shift it in temperature, you can take it. But temperature tuning of a laser diode is slow. So what we used was we used, first we used a Litzman cavity, which is a dual cavity, uh, uh, it's a diode laser, it's, a little, it's about this big, and it's using atomic spectroscopy and pollution monitoring, it goes over 100 nanometers, 
In fact, we bought four of them and the company phoned us because they didn't know why we were using them. So <laughs> it was a new use for their laser, but we found them, I have to say, a little unreliable. And at the moment, we're using a very nice, brand new, super compact solstice laser from a company called M Square. It's a beautiful tunable Thai sapphire. It's a little bit of overkill. It does normal Raman. And it, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very small system, though, in fact. It's a very new new laser that's just come out. Or if you have an older one, you can use something like a ring Thai sapphire 3900S. Okay. Spectrophysics, they work as well. Very robust, works every time. We've got lots of studies on this with a dozen papers, and other groups are now using it as well. I could, I could show you them, but it's, it's not as simple as just having a little diet. That I have to be honest. Okay, you do need a, a, a little bit of a, a step up in light source. Yeah, we have a question here from. Uh, while doing the PCA, like I, you just showed that there is a like a separation between the different classes, right? If in case like there is no classification between the two classes, there is not such a nice separation. So what can be the possible reason behind that? If it didn't work, you mean? Yeah, if it didn't work. So I think well, I don't, I don't know all those. Well, I remember before you can maybe get things like photo bleaching or damage when we play with the light num that we have, or to whiskies can be very, very close as well. Okay, so that's something we, we haven't actually come across that. Um, in a big way, we've been able to distinguish 100 whiskies, and the reason we're not, we're not so worried about that is because the question that the industry wants won't be to say, can I tell the difference between a 25 year old Lafroig and cooking whiskey? They'll say, is this, because they're so far apart, they'll say, is 25, they'll say, can you make sure it's 25, not 20 years, or 15 years? And that, if we can do a, a, a more contained problem like that, then they're happy. But that's a great question. It could happen. And we haven't done every whiskey in the world. We, I should say we've done this also for olive oil and American whiskey as well. And it works uh, pretty well there too. But it is, it's certainly possible that will happen. Yeah. And by the way, I wasn't saying that uh, ramen isn't good. I think it's a fantastic technique. I suppose I was making the point that if you do things very carefully, like in, they do in Kishan's lab, and you keep all of the constraints uh, the same, then you can get very good differentiation. Did I see somebody? Uh, but if you don't do that, you could get confused. Yeah. Breath analysis would be applicable, or is it not? So which analysis? Breath. Breath analysis. All right. So there's this thing called the optical nose. I remember when you breathe out and they try to measure hydrocarbon content. I believe they just do this through standard absorption spectroscopy at the moment. Um, I guess you could use Raman if you had time, but integration time and the weak weakness of Raman might make it challenging. But you could do that potentially. I don't. I don't. I. I don't know enough. If they're like that, a group's probably trying that a lot. So that's my only downside. I think if I understand, you breathe, and then they take an absorption spectra and they try and look at hydrocarbon content in your breath, and correlate that with particularly things like uh, mass spectroscopy. Is it mass spectroscopy? Yeah. Is it okay? Well, maybe it's well, but then you don't, don't sort of do it on the fly with someone in front of somebody. So. Indeed, Rama could be used for that, but we'd have to sit down and work out the numbers and uh, see how we'd have to integrate all together to get a good enough signal. It could be used, there's no reason why. The other Rama's been done in air for lots of things. Liquid biopsies, which are like area of the land. Liquid biopsies? Yeah, you detect cancer in your blood. Right. And it fragments DNA and you know, okay. other signals. Yeah, you could you could use that, I guess, maybe in a chip. But again, you know, it's the amount of material acquisition, so I don't want to. I think it, it is very, very challenging, but if you find the right problem and you do it well, I think this has applications like many things. Finding the right problem, tailoring it to something that really works. So have we come to any kind of conclusion about why it is that there is no approved Rama <laughs> system? Uh, well, okay, so the, why, I would, let me turn it back. Is there an approved fluorescent system? Is there an approved car system? Is there an approved OCT system for cancer? In the colon or atherosclerosis. Yeah. I think I think it's 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 there's just too many variables at the moment. Maybe there needs a big emphasis if people really believe in it to have a standardized probe that can work. But people buy a lot of Raman probes and I found that locally certainly we're helping a lot of patients locally, but I hands up, I'm not gonna say I'm gonna publish a paper and say you guys should use that probe because it may there may be practices from your clinicians yeah. or some other quirk that means it's different. So I think you it's, it's a really, really hard thing to do. Yeah, we, we should explain that, you know, when you're trying to get something like that into the clinic, you want to get it past the uh, FDA, for example. Yeah. Uh, the 
nice people, the NICE in the UK, <laughs> who haven't really approved OCT yet, right? <laughs> which is interesting, and uh, and the medical device directive in, in the EU. And, and to do this, you're talking about double blind studies, which means yeah. thousands of patients. And many of you will do PhD projects uh, on Raman, OCT, other things, and you will maybe work with you know five or six patients or a dozen patients and you will uh, get that final in vivo data that you're going to finish your thesis with and then you'll move on and will anybody do the thousand patient study it's very expensive it uh, takes a lot of uh, effort and uh, it's it's really for the clinicians to do that i suppose in this community we're usually developing the technology just to get it up to that level where we prove the principle uh, we seem to be missing that gap yeah. to get into the next very, level. Very, it's a very good discussion to have and, and probably will continue in the week, but yes, it's missing for RAM and it's missing for other technologies and how to bridge it is... Uh, but the, the bottleneck is, is concentration. Right. It is the actual levels, the analog level set. And with SERS, it just is, is it just not reproducible <coughs> enough? Yeah, That's my, yeah, so there's not, for example, many people, you read millions of SERS substrates, it's a beautiful piece of physics. So SERS, just for those of you who don't know, it's a, it's a plasmon enhancement of the Raman signal, it actually enhances this, um, like, a huge number, a million upwards, to 10 to the 10. It's great, but you know, you don't, sometimes you don't know what you're seeing, it enhances anything on there, and then the reproducibility, and it's because it's plasmonic, it's near field usually, and you have to get the analyte really into the... <laughs> interacting with the sample and so forth. Yeah. So, so again, sure if, if that protein, and we're usually yeah. talking about proteins, is, is within nanometers, yeah. tens of nanometers of a metal, it gets an enhancement of the Raman signal. But uh, can you amplify the substance itself, the protein itself? Or is that you, just to... You could do, but the holy grail is to be able to do like what you're doing there, you know, just to be able to put it on a, a droplet form or on something, put it onto a chip, measure, and then get your concentration. Yeah. But you're talking about nanomotors. Then that's different, you know. Yeah, nanomolar. You know, yeah, I know it's 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 milli it's milli to micromolar in Raman usually, unless you have a yeah. Answer. So, but so when you're getting that scale, and you're just a, I guess what well, what well, do you have a comment on that? How far are we away from that? Um, well, we I think we we are quite far uh, yeah. for urea. We're um, yeah we're two or three orders of magnitude away. Yeah. If I wanted to do it, I'd probably go to something like stimulated Raman or something. But then. The real estate for a laser is too big, or the technology, you know, it's just, we don't have that. And I've got too many other things to do so, to get invested in that at the moment. So I think it's just really hard to get down to that. That's why you see amazing sensor papers that end up as just clever physics ideas, you know, and uh, that don't really yeah. make it into and the gold standard is still a laser. Which could yeah. That. And that's why we, we haven't really moved on, it's, you know, from the, the technology hasn't got in anywhere near the clinic yet. The problem is much more complicated than the whiskey problem, though, yeah. because whiskey is double distilled in Scotland. They they, <laughs> they they rob this idea from Ireland. They kind of half do it in Scotland, you know. So it should be triple distilled. <laughs> but if you you know if you, obviously if you distill something, it's it's much more yeah. pure, right? Uh, in when we're talking about biology, we're talking about a messy, very <laughs> variable substance. We're talking about tens of thousands of proteins, um, even in in the blood, and we're trying to identify. Uh, maybe a hundred important ones that we have to separate out from those uh, 10,000 proteins and we want to, uh, eventually you end up with maybe a picoliter to deal with so you know uh, the, the bigger number of proteins you want to separate out then the, you know the smaller amount of if you, if you just take a few mils of blood to begin with the smaller amount of blood you end up with for that particular uh, process so you know it is a it, it is a problem that goes on so we should move on to the the next lecture. The discussions are always very yeah, good. Yeah, let's go. So 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 I'll, I'll curtail the lectures depending on what the discussion yeah. goes. So I'm happy to just uh, continue. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, complete change of. Um, so that's the one and only Robin lecture. So I'm, now I'm going to tell you what I've been doing and other people are doing in optical manipulation. So this is more fundamental. It has big impact in, um, in single molecule biophysics and I'm going to use this as a, as a, as a test bed to show you complex beam shaping, um, which will then lead on to imaging, which um, time and committee will do. I'll just show you. Okay, so here we go. 
So, in 1610, Kepler, in between uh, looking at laws of planetary motion and um, protecting his mother from claims of witchcraft, which had rather dire consequences in those days, also wondered about the tale of a comet. And if you read De Solaris, he uh, conjectured that the tail of a comet was kind of pushed away from the sun by some kind of solar wind or solar pressure. This is a, a person called Johannes Hevelius, who was a historian and also a philosopher who, who was fascinated by this problem. And there's a fictitious meeting between him, Kepler, and Aristotle about the origin of comet tails uh, on, the, on the cover of his book. And you can, if you ever go to Max Planck Museum, you can see more details on that. This is actually a video of this, um, a comet from the Soho satellite NASA. It doesn't point directly away from the sun, but I won't bore you with the physics of comet tails today, which is a beautiful topic in its own right. But you can see it does do that. And so we know that Kepler was correct. Essentially, light pressure, though, um, if, I, if I shine, well, I won't shine, I haven't got a laser pointer, but I wouldn't be shining at you anyway. If I shine a laser pointer at me, I don't recoil. The force is very, very small. Um, but we know that he was essentially right, and that material is coming off that comet due to the sun and, if you like, light pressure. So I'm now going to engage the audience to see how weak you are with afternoon with a nice warm room after lunch. Um, so let's say I have a block of wood, and I give you a little gun or a pistol, and it has two bullets, an aluminium bullet and a rubber bullet. They're absolutely exactly the same size, speed, and mass. Okay, and I have two objectives. One is I wish to knock the block of wood over. And the second one is damage. That's my two considerations. So the question is, which bullet is likely to do which, or would they both be the same? See the lecturer looking a bit perplexed as well at this question. They should participate too. All right. So this, so this is for thinking like a physicist. So. Which is most likely to knock the block over? Who thinks the rubber bullet? The rubber bullet. About 10 of you. Who thinks the aluminium bullet? One person. Who thinks they're the same? There's no D. I believe it depends on the mass and those. Yeah, well, okay. They're all the same. So if you just, okay, first yeah, one? Yeah, same, but, you know, it was two. <laughs> okay. they're, huh? No, no, they're, well, they're both going in the same, it's likely order, okay, so absolutely the same, it seems they're absolutely the same. So it seems at least 80% of the audience are unsure of the answer, right? No, all right, worry. Okay, now then, let's go on to the easier one, which is which is more likely to damage the block of wood? Who thinks the rubber bullet's more likely to damage? Oh, okay, good. Who thinks aluminium? Biggest consensus so far, only 15. And who thinks they should be both the same? Okay, right, so, um, and so most people are still unsure, so there's like over 70% of the audience haven't put their hand up at all. All right, should get those little clickers so we can have an idea of anything. Okay, let's think about damage first. Let's go backwards. What do I do when I damage something? If I have a golf ball and I smack it at the wall, okay? It's going to damage the wall. When I do damage, I'm actually transferring energy. Okay, I'm either causing a crack or I'm causing a hole, but I'm transferring energy from one object to another in some form. Okay, we, don't, we won't worry about whether it's stress or fracturing or heat or okay. Let's just keep it really sim simple. Okay, if I want to damage the block, um, then what am I thinking about? I'm thinking about something that will transfer its energy to the block. Now, if I gave you a golf ball and a squash ball, and I threw both of them at this wall, which one's going to cause most damage? Everybody, that's a bit right. No, so that's exactly the same principle, okay? And, that, and that, uh, let me throw them exactly the same speed. They've go, both got half mv squared, but the, goal, the squash ball is going to bounce off, right? It's going to bounce off with quite a lot of the kinetic energy it came in with, whereas the golf ball will probably thud and then drop on the floor. So most of its energy will be transferred to the wall. So if I'm damaging a block of wood, it's very likely the aluminium bullet will actually transfer, will probably get embedded in the block of wood and you know, either cause it to crack or whatever. So aluminium is most likely to do that because that is an energy consideration, energy. If I want to knock something over, what do I need to do? What do I need to exert? 
Yeah, okay, correct. Yeah, momentum force, great. You're saying, right, I need to, let, let's stick with momentum. What is the momentum of a ball of mass M moving with speed V? Right. Now, let's go back to the golf ball. Golf ball's coming in, smack, it lands on the wall, it's got momentum MV and then it falls down. What was its final momentum? Zero. Right, let's say I throw a squash ball at the wall. Comes in with MV and bounces off. What's its momentum? Minus. What's the change in momentum? Two. Right, so which is it going to exert the bigger force? <laughs> it's not a trick question. It's, it's a squash ball, right? It's going to exchange TMV. So, the first one is momentum, right? Everybody happy with that? Yeah. You're all looking for flex, right? Okay. So, momentum. I'm just not sure that the golf ball would bounce off. But yeah, okay. Well, think, think of a big 11 ball or something. Okay. You get the kind of principle, right? So, the idea is that in the first one, we need to try and force is the change in momentum. So 2MV, so the rubber ball will probably transfer more momentum. And the second one, it's energy. Now why on earth am I going from Kepler to throwing golf balls and squash balls at blocks of wood? It doesn't make any sense. Well, we need to remember that photons have momentum. Okay, the photon momentum given by de Broglie in the 1920s. And these are some examples of key experiments a hundred years, and that's just less than a hundred years ago now, that actually show um, the momentum transfer of light. Now, why did I use a block of wood and a golf ball and a, and a rubber bullet? That's not what I wanted to do, but here's an experiment, in a, uh, something I set first year undergrads, is what is the light from a mirror? So if I shine light on a mirror, you shouldn't do this because it's about straight back at you, what is the force? So physicists would do that. Who's turned their laser on in their lab and their optics has moved? Oh yeah, that's one person. Okay, right. <laughs> you need to bolt that optics before we get heavier optics. Okay, this is a brilliant and tri a trivial calculation you can do to show that one a laser pointer will exert a piconewton of force. All right, so the power in the laser is the number of photons by the de Broglie h over lambda times c. Momentum is h over lambda. Force is rate of change of momentum, just like my squash ball. The photons are bouncing off. And it's a really simple equation, it's 2p over c. That's simple. 2p over c. One milliwatt laser pointer divided by 3 times 10 to the 8, 6.67 times 10 to the minus 12. Piconewtons. That's why optical tweezers exert piconewtons in two lines. Right? How big is a piconewton? It's equivalent to the gravitational force of attraction between you and your tablet or laptop. It's not something you're going to worry about. But I'm going to worry about it, and I'm going to show you what we can do with it. And so people like Ashkin and Gordon in the 1960s and 70s worried about this, and they said, well, OK, I'm not, I'm not going to move a mirror in my laboratory, or I'm not going to exert enough force to drag a, you know, a glass of whiskey over or whatever. But if I make M very, very small, maybe this starts to become interesting. If you take an object and you halve its diameter for the same density, it's an for the weight. So they said, well, let's go, let's forget things on a macroscopic scale, let's go down to a cell. And they got numbers that were very big. So that's why optical tweezers work at the very small scale level. They work typically from a red blood cell down to a single atom. Now, I'm not going to have time to tell you about resonances, which this, these forces also apply in the atomic regime. And this is a, an experiment you can do. So here, this is an experiment we did in our lab, just showing the type of thing they did in the 1960s. A laser beam goes up, lots of little droplets from a, a little spray or an aftershave or something come down, and every so often, a droplet stops. So that's being held by light. Okay? So that's a droplet held by light in air. And you can see something, and then it gets knocked out because of air currents or whatever. It's just a little demo. So if you want to do it, you only need a few milliwatts. Just point a laser pointer up, make sure it's nice and nice there for the big beam block. Just squirt some, uh, and have a little camera at 90 degrees. You'll see that. It's a pretty easy experiment to set up. Very nice. But you can see, as I get bigger, it's going to be very hard to exert forces. Now, here, um, the force isn't just the light bouncing off the droplet. You just say, hold on, Kisha, you're, you're cheating. Hold on, hold on. Some of the light goes through that droplet, doesn't it? It's transparent. It's made of water or some other chemical, I bet some of the light's refracted, and you're absolutely right. So there's another process going on, it's not just bouncing like light off a mirror, that was just there to give you the basic principle, 
But that's what one can do by uh, using light and um, pushing it. So the first traps, um, it was in 1970, well actually, so a field that's been around 46 years, it's a pretty good field, right? They're still going strong. So I've just come from San Diego where I was co-chairing a conference on this. We have 120 submissions. It's still the second biggest conference at SPIE's annual meeting. In fact, I think it was the biggest. Um, I won't go into all the things people are doing, but they're incredible. So here, in Ashkin's first trap, instead of levitating a, a, a droplet in air, of course, we're not interested particularly in this audience about tra trapping in air. Um, and um, we're more interested in how we might apply this to cells or biological material or so forth. So what people do was, and not, not the first geometry because the uh, optical fibers weren't generated in those days, around in those days, they just, instead of levitating this way, turn it 90 degrees, it's rather like two jets of water coming at me, standing here and stopping me moving. Okay? And this is known as a dual beam trap. So you can see two single mode fibers. See the core here at 125 microns and a little object in the middle. There it is. So that's a video from Monica Richmada's group, for example. You go back, the first paper in this was 93, or uh, 94 in fact, by Constable. That's Mara Apprentice's group at Harvard. And you can move it. Now, how are they moving the object between the fibers? It's rather like just reducing the power level in each uh, fiber. It's really simple. And you can play games, and this is using another beam. So this is two divergent beams, no lenses. The only lens is for observation at the moment. Very simple, very, very simple. Two fiber optics pointing and grabbing things. Now, this is quite a good trap. It's very, very good. It's um, used as the basis, we'll see in a second. You can use it for ramen as well. You can take ramen with this. Why would you take ramen with a trap as well? Not just because you can do it and publish a cool paper. You do it because the cell will be immobilized away from the surface. You could do a microfluidic flow, maybe related to some of the questions we had earlier. That kind of thing. So that's actually still ongoing as a study. Let me show you what you can do in the bio. Because they're cells. Why would they stay stiff and stay the same? So shape? Then these, aren't, these are beads. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah, okay. Even if they were cells, they would stay the same. Okay. They, well, they would probably just flip and orient but they would stretch or contract if you increase the laser power. This is quite low laser power. And I'll, I'll, I'll do that actually in the next slide. All right, so now some hardcore physics. Um, so the momentum of light in a dielectric material, it's not something you really want to learn about at four o'clock on a Monday afternoon in the warm room, but let me just tell you, there's two formalisms, but for all intents and purposes, just to remember it's related to M, the refractive index. That's all I want you to remember, okay? in the Minkowski, some of you might know about the Abraham Minkowski uh, dilemma, but that's not for today. What I'm telling you is, why am I telling you that? That means light in this room is different. The momentum of light in this room, if I shine a laser pointer outside, it's different as it propagates from here to the door, and it goes, it goes through the glass, it's higher in the glass, and then going back again. You'll all accept that. Can I have a change in momentum like that? Yes. What's the change in momentum give you? Well, we just did it with the block of wood. A force! But so if I shine a laser from here outside uh, that, that beige wall, there will be a force on that glass. I don't blind myself in this process. Can I measure that force or do anything? Let's have a look. Well, this is exactly what Joachim Gook and Joseph Kass did 15 years ago. And they're like all good physicists, they approximate a cell, a cube, and they said it's got a refractive index of something like this. It's put in buffer solution of 1.33. And forget the maths, I put it up there for you to work through in your own ledger. It's a lovely little problem. You see the blue arrows, right? Just like my light being going outside the door, what happens is there's a reaction force. The red arrows is all you need to keep your eye on. It turns out there is a force away from the medium of higher refractive index. Right? So if, now imagine I put a partially inflated beach ball between two jets of water, you know, it's going to crush. What I'm saying to you now is that if you put a light beam onto a cell, it's actually going to bulge outwards. It's going to try and expand. Because this refractive index means its N is higher than the water. That's the principle of the optical stretcher. Mm -hmm. who's, bought, who's bought fruit at the supermarket? Everybody does online shopping. Right? Nobody <laughs> <laughs> goes shopping anymore. Right, so you must have picked up a nectarine or a peach or a plum. Who's ever squeezed a piece of fruit to see if it's right? That's what optics can do, but you can squeeze a cell and you can do mechanical phenotyping using this process. 
Okay, so everybody got the piece of physics there? All right. Um, there'll be a copy of the slide so you can work through this at your leisure. Um, but it's actually counterintuitive. But the beautiful piece of physics is by passing light through some um, uh, this medium, this medium is going to expand out. Okay, so what did, um, and this is actually used by quite a lot of labs now, uh, mostly still for physics and sort of uh, pilot studies. There, are, there have been clinical trials for oral cancer and um, other cancer as well. These are some examples, the early work. Um, so this is the idea. So in a microfluidic flow, we fast the cells along, the two beams come along, it's like my partially inflated board, and the la laser beam comes on. If we increase the power such so that delta P is big enough, you squash the cell. And what you do is you take a picture. There's no, nothing added, you take, you squash the cells. And these, these cancer cell, uh, uh, breast cancer cells, including an oncogene added, and so what they do is they do a distribution. The idea is to see, basically, um, when cells metastasize, a lot changes. And they actually migrate to different parts of the body. They were looking at the mechanical changes in the cell. This is not the only study you can do. People have actually proved that we have optical fibers in the eye. I could talk about that for 10 minutes if you want. A beautiful paper, again, by a group at Cambridge. Amazing, there's a front page of PNAS about five, six years ago. Um, if you wanted to, but this is an example of the distribution of cells. And you can see here, basically cancerous cells are more squashy. Now this isn't the only test you do, but what they found was a deformability by taking pictures meant that they could say, so what they do is they, for example, might say to a patient or whatever, if you've got too many cells, maybe in this part, you go and do another test. So that's the kind of idea. And they're using it at the moment to do oral carcinoma, which is actually a very difficult thing to test for, and a few other things, and they're parallelizing also the flow. flow yeah. What's the shape of the beam then? What, what do you it's a simple Gaussian beam coming out of single mode fiber. There's nothing fancy at the moment. Absolutely standard beam. Okay, so they test these highest in, in the center when it hits the, the yes. cell. So um, what happens is the beam just simply diverges, it hits the cell, passes through each side, and the cell bulges out. You have two beams because you don't want the cell to be guided one way or another, you want it to be held which we'll come on to with this, this trapping line, that trap idea. And what happens is they crank up the power because if you put the numbers into the previous graph, you'll find you can trap something typically with about 5 to 10 milliwatts, but to the optical stretching, you need hundreds of milliwatts. Now you might say, well, that's pretty bad. But if you use near-infrared light, you've got to remember the power density is low because this is coming out of a fiber and diverging. So it's actually not as bad as you think. Okay, so that's the kind of study people do. Um, also, this is now work. This is, a, uh, for example, work at Jena using these dual beam traps for on chip ramen. And here they're using detection fibers with Bragg rating. So these are just two examples. And here on the left is an example of using the dual beam trap for ramen microscope spectroscopy. So even this simple two, two beams pointing at one another, holding cells, squashing them, these are obviously much lower powers than what I just showed you in the Gook and Cass work. Just show examples, yeah. So, like, okay, jumping back to the previous one. So, do you think that the next step could possibly be an in vivo test like that when you focus on the capillary? Kind of the same way as like in vivo flow cytometry is working right now. So, the same kind of an approach. Like, like, yes, yeah, so that's an interesting question. So, I'll just review the question. Could this be a precursor to in vivo flight cytometry yeah. or in vivo testing? In vivo stretching. Yeah. Cells so, the problem would be typically your, the flow of cells in your body is going to be so fast, it's going to be very hard to travel. What if it's a capillary somewhere? I don't know. It, well, in principle, yes. In fact, I'll show you um, in, I think I have that, I have a slide of trapping inside a mouse. Yeah. So, they cause. Um, uh, to cause thrombosis with red blood cells. Not with a dual beam trap, but with a single beam trap. So with some of the complex photonics, you may be able to do that. But I, I would guess that the flow speeds, normally optical tweezers, the forces are still quite small. So you cannot do really... In so how slow do you think you need it in order to be able to do it? So you can trap something in a dual beam trap readily at hundreds of microns per second. Okay, so but not to really capture, stretch, and release and burn something. So in order to be able to capture, stretch. Yeah. It can be done instantaneously, so you just need a little camera to do that, obviously, <laughs> but you could do that, I guess. But so you would really have to stretch and take, because it's a mechanical process, you have to Yeah, it's so uh, we've not done any stretching, but I well we have done some stretching of red blood cells. It'll take uh, 
maybe hundreds of milliseconds. Ah, okay. Sorry. So the previous slide was not stretching. Yes, it was. Okay. You can see that the stretching is taking a little bit of time. <laughs> A bit less than a second, I guess. Yeah, typically. Okay. typically. Okay. It would depend on each cell. I mean, what, what, I, 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 I don't know immediately of a paper that's compared a lot of cells for their stretching time. Um, but we found red blood cells can take uh, as 100 milliseconds or so. Okay. Yeah. Maybe that's too long. Maybe it is. Yeah. Vladimir Jarov and, and yeah. those guys have done some cell trapping in vivo yeah. oh, uh, right? cytometry okay. and use photoacoustics. Uh, but, but I. If I remember correctly, magnetic. they use magnetic. Uh, oh, magnetic. Yeah, have a comment on the two. Yeah. Yes, magnetic, but also too. Once you get to the cell level, sub-cell level, it isn't true, but uh, uh, radiation force from acoustics, because the wave speed is five orders of magnitude lower. The forces are five orders of magnitude higher. That's right. And so, uh, radiation force with acoustics has been used forever. Levitation experiments, all that. What's interesting is, as people are going to higher frequencies. You're starting to get it down to single cell level. So the trapping that you're talking mm -hmm. about in the um, in fast-moving vessels has now been proposed. Nobody's demonstrated yet, but now being proposed yeah. for doing acoustic trapping because you can do it in fast-moving vessels. And if you're looking for things like rare cell types, you do not want to be in the slow flow field. No, no right? that's right. You want to be you want to be processing in a very very high flow rate uh, system. So it's potential for acoustic trapping is starting to come back again. Uh, people look when you say high frequencies, are you talking about gigahertz? No, like hundreds of megahertz. Mm -hmm. hundred, you know, 100 megahertz, which you can penetrate multiple millimeters, so it's still relatively peripheral, but it's not surface. And you still can get the forces. So, I mean, it's an interesting yeah. proposal, but I've not seen the demonstration. Mm -hmm. Focus it onto a, a, a cell size, 10 microns. Yeah, through you can, you know, hundred, yeah, two millimeters. So you 15 not micron easy. wavelength, 100 mi megahertz and 15 micron wavelength. Yeah. So you're down to say people have gotten to that now, down to the single cell level in systems like this, like you're showing in the microfluidic systems and the like. But the, uh, what you have to do in the microfluidics is we turn the acoustics way down because we'll blow the things up. Um, but anyway, I, mean, I think it's a potential for doing that. And integrating all this magnetic uh, acoustic. But the optical has, you know, the, the forces are just so much smaller. But your wavelengths are great, you know, so it's what regime is going to work. Optical. Yeah, sure. Acoustic traps have a lot of potential. So just for the audience, remember we came up with the 2P over C, so uh, what we're hearing is if you drop C, the force goes up. Yeah, okay. five you need a, yeah, orders of magnitude, but then you have to deal with acoustic trapping and geometries for that. So it depends what your application is. Right. So this, this might be good just for a small biopsy of small cells, maybe in a lab or under a microscope, but in vivo, perhaps acoustics might be a good way to use similar principles for testing. I mean, it's just it. So, how do we go from this dual beam trap to single beam trap? Because instead of just um, moving an object between two beams, I might want to just move it and hold, hold, um, hold it and move it. Oops, I've just hit the. Sorry, do you punch on the audio? It's not. <laughs> Right, so Isaac Newton, Newton's third law, every action has a reaction. All you have to remember, keeping it super simple, two rays of light coming at a wall, and they get refracted, right? I'm, just, I'm ignoring the scattering component. I deliberately drawn the ray above the ball, thicker than the one below. And that means that this ray is bent downwards, that one is bent upwards. Now, let's do some physics again. All the light had momentum going left to right as it approached the ball. When it leaves the ball, the ball has made the light go down. So what does the ball have to do? Hmm? Go up. Newton's third law, right? That's it. So now why have I drawn the rays asymmetrically? Because that's a gradient. There's a gradient of intensity, right? So in other words, the ball moves towards the brightest part. That's essentially how to do this. Okay? All right? And this is assuming the object has a higher refractive index than its surroundings. Okay, so if you do that, you can trap objects in three dimensions. Now, so that gradient 
applies left right. So if I focus the light beam on this object, on this coffee cup, and let's assume it's a transparent object, light is bent and it'll be pulled into the middle of the beam. Now if I do that, I might have it moving like this, doing well, but I'd really like to lift it up. How do I do that? Do I need new physics? No, I don't. Because by the very act of creating a tightly focused beam in this direction, the lateral direction naturally creates a, a, a gradient in the action direction. And if I use a high numerical aperture optic, I'll have light coming in at a skew angle and leaving the object going down so the ball will come up. Add in the scattering component, which I've ignored in this picture, for simplicity, and you can see I'll just sit below the focus, because the scattering will have to push down. So that's how, and with one light beam in a simple microscope, confocals, multifocal, you can trap an object. And that's what you see. So, well, you see more than that in this, but um, that's my name written in little beads. We've even done it in cells. And it turns out my name's also an anagram of Arthur Ashkin who invented this method. Um, and you can, that's how, I'll, I'll tell you how we create lots of traps in a moment. And you can trap big things. So this is micron objects. These are silver nanoparticles down at tens of nanometers. Let me just give you some physics uh, before we move on. This is a beautiful Hookean spring. The scattering force on the object is typically proportional to intensity, but this gradient force is proportional to the gradient of the field. We've already seen that with my thick and thin ray, but it's also proportional to a parameter called alpha. Does anybody know what alpha is? It's the polarizability of the object. It's polarizability, okay? And what polarizability, you remember electromagnetism, that like great course that you all took? That can polarizability of a dielectric object is proportional to the volume of an object. If I use a one micron bead and I go down to 100 nanometers, my polarizability drops by a factor of 1,000. So how on earth did I trap these? Well, that's because gold, silver, is very polarizable, as is known in the nanoparticle community. So it's very easy to trap gold, silver, etc. at this size scale, but it'd be very, very hard to trap something that was dielectric at a small scale. So that's one of the challenges and why people to trap single viruses, single molecules directly, or bacteria, wish to increase this term. So, yeah? One question, when you try to trap silver um, particles, um, silver is not transparent usually, so why don't you push it away? So okay, that's a great question. So why don't we push silver away? Well, I have on a different talk, <laughs> the mathematics of the scattering force versus the way the scattering and the gradient force both scale. The scattering force drops very, very quickly with the radius of the power compared to the gradient. So this actually drops down very, very fast. Okay, so that's why this becomes more or less negligible when you go down to very, very small objects because of the scalability. But that's in a different more, more map. Medical tweezers talk. It's a great question. Um, so that's why it doesn't get pushed away, basically. Gradient force really dominates because it's got a massive polarizability. But there's a downside because the polarizability of silver and gold, one you all probably know, it has a complex, complex refractive index, which means it absorbs energy. All right? Absorption leads to heating. Heating is bad in optical tweezers. So if you have too much power, you'll see little bubbles forming in your liquid or thermal effects. So people have used tweezers to collect particles for therapy and all these things, but they have to be a bit careful with that. For those of you interested, you can see these lovely colors here. That's because of the polydispersity in the plasma on resonance. Let me just end up with you again, because it's quite cool. So you can see that, and in the middle it looks white. Why does that? Because a lot of particles collect. I'm not trying to be clever and just trap one at the moment, but as they all collect, they average out to give me beautiful white. <coughs> Okay, you see sometimes a red one comes in or a green one, etc. Okay, what does this look like? Some more cool videos. Um, so this is a Google Sketch to scale. I'm going to take a trip with a green laser beam through uh, not a thirty-five thousand dollar objective. This one's a couple of hundred dollars in our lab. We don't have thirty-five thousand to spend on one objective like all this lab, uh, and that's a red blood cell that you might trap. So that gives you a feeling of the scale there, of the size of the beam. That's actually absolutely to scale that little drawing. And here we're just going to grab it and move it into a capillary. Okay, so you can trap a cell, you can trap a bead. 
We don't trap single molecules directly because of this polarizability. So what do people do? Um, they actually um, play around with something different. Now let me just, just I'm going to keep the mass to a minimum, but that's just a little harmonic oscillator, all right? Like a little pendulum or something. And that's exactly what optical tweezers is, except the first term, which is inertia, m x double dot, is negligible. The second term is damping, and, and that's the restoring force, kx. So k is like my springs. So it turns out that a little particle in this Gaussian beam is rather like a little per world's perfect little Hookean spring. And how do you measure this? This is very interesting because it leads to what Colin said this morning. Remember he said it may, it may, um, that we can measure single object. Remember Palm and Storm, what they do is they sparsely illuminate so we can measure the center of gravity of this one. Then we turn something on and then something else gets illuminated. We can tell the precision of an individual object very accurately. Optical tweezers can measure the position of a single object to um, the accuracy of the ball radius in room temperature. That's pretty small, isn't it? You can do that, it's called single. Okay. How do they do that? We use a quadrant diode, for example, so the object wiggles around. Here's my parabolic well from my Gaussian potential. It wiggles around, I image onto a quadrant photodiode. I get a jiggly signal as it's doing Brownian motion. Over long time scales, it explores the edges of my trap. And then I take a position histogram, and that tells me the potential, the well that I've created. If it's a Hookean spring and force is proportional to displacement, what is the well proportional to? What's the potential well? It's parabolic, right? Because force is minus del u. So if, I, if this is proportional to x, the force, if you integrate that, it's the well is proportional to x squared. Right? So that's what you can get if you fit this. And then you can take a, what's called a power spectrum. Okay. Now, because it's such a beautiful system and you can measure all these things very accurately, people do amazing things. So, let me just say a little bit about biology. People have done some amazing studies on which laser wavelength is used for damage or not. And it turns out this is cloning efficiency for, um, and wavelength dependence of E. coli compared to Chinese. I always get the question, what wavelength do you use? What's the cell viability in optical traps? Do your own viability assay, number one. Usually pick wavelengths in the near infrared, and it turns out wavelengths such as 830 nanometers or 970 give you the mass of cloning efficiency for cells, so minimum damage. But you can hold cells in optical traps for minutes to hours without any damage quite regularly. So that's why people work again in this beautiful therapeutic window. Where does it fit? It fits down there compared to AFM. So we're looking at the pico end. And motors isn't, isn't cars, motors is linear and rotary molecular motors. Kinesin motion on a microtubule, actin myosin, bacterial flagella, they all exert forces and torques uh, that relate down to the pico-newton level, and it complements AFM. That's why optical tweezers is so, it's been very hard to displace. It's measured the smallest force changes known to man. It's measured and understood the uh, worm-like model for DNA, it's actually added an amazing value to look at torsional constants for DNA, and it's an area that's really hard to get to with any other methodology. That's why it's surviving and being able to do things. It's one of the reasons, anyway. And there's a pico Newton. Um, this is the kind of thing you might do if you were looking at kinesin. Kinesin is the carrier in your cells, the cargo carrier. And so this is AD, ATP to ADP and phosphate conversion. You can watch a single molecule reaction at that level in optical traps. They've actually resolved major questions about how that reaction happens. They've resolved in other essays how um, actin myosin work. And here they, they discern from, there's better ones than this now, but um, the steps these, these objects take, and they were discerned to be eight nanometers. So people really solve some big questions about single molecule biophysics. It's been revolutionized since 1986 with optical traps. There are about one order of magnitude more groups in biology using optical tweezers than physics. A lot of people don't know that. Um, so that's how it's done. And so instead of trapping the kinesin directly, they attach it and they watch a little optical trap wiggle. Remember that quadrant photodiode? Watch it wiggle. And then we use that, for example, to take this measurement as it carries something along that microtube. Uh, 
this is just the results of modeling or real? It's just real. Everything's real. The, the video is obviously modeling, but, uh, or some animation. Every, every, everything I've shown you uh, in the previous and this is real. It's all experimental data. So there's amazing groups around the world doing crazy things. Here's an example. This is Stephen Quake's group at Stanford tying a single piece of DNA in a knot. This is lambda phage fluorescent DNA with two beads attached. And because DNA is negatively charged, they can't, tie, they can't actually tie a knot tightly enough. Why are they looking at this? They're looking at um, enzymology of top isomerases. They're actually looking at, you know, the DNA in your cell gets knotted and unknotted all the time. They were doing some interesting physics with knots, but they also were actually um, studying this um, topological constraints of how DNA gets unknotted and knotted inside a cell for the first time and trying to arrest that in cancer and cancer cells. So these are just examples of what one can do. I should point out there was a Japanese group who did this experiment four years before, but I'm afraid their video wasn't very good, so uh, I've used this one here for this particular. And what is the scale of this? Like, so first of all, how they inched again, and what is the scale? Yeah, sure, okay. All right, so that is a single piece of lambda phage DNA. Those will be one micron beads, so you're looking at a field of view of maybe 50 by 50 microns. Okay, so it's and it's a, combined, it's a combined fluorescence plus optical tweezing center. So it'll be optical trapping in the near infrared, probably at 10, 70 nanometers, with a dual beam trap, so two traps, and they are using biotin streptavidin between them, and then using probably a sequential fluorescence imaging scheme. Um, yeah. The media details, that's probably remembered from that paper. Okay. Well, you can do other beautiful things. If you want a review paper on this, this is an amazing paper that hardly anybody reads, but I think it's an amazing paper by Tom Perkins' group of Boulder, Colorado. Um, what I just wanted to say is that the force is, if you like, even though you're measuring it, you've got a trap and you've got a molecule. All right? So what people do is, if you do the extension, the extension that you might measure on DNA is not directly the extension you measure on the beam. Okay? There's a correction factor. All right? And so people do something very, very clever, right? What would I do to that equation to make it equal? Get rid of that, right? How do I remove the stiffness of the trap? Don't use a trap at all. Genius, right. So if I don't use a trap, though, I've not got it localized, though. So how do I get a trap with no stiffness, but actually still trap it? What am I talking about? And, and oh, yeah. When you're talking about these uh, forces, and uh, you saying you measure the distance, right? Yeah. But when you're talking about the stiffness, so I assume the stiffness would relate to the square of interaction between the particles themselves, and thus it should be the square which you take into account. Why should it be square? Well, because if two surfaces are stick together, so they will not be measurement of distance, it will be a measure of, of square uh, ratio. So, okay, so uh, I think just some misunderstood. Okay, so what we're doing is I, I attach a molecule. This B is a harmonic oscillator. So force is just proportional to displacement. If I push this a certain distance and I know it's calibration factor, okay, it moves. So it's not touching anything. So that's what I measure. I'm not measuring it attached to this. Okay, so then this touches something else, does some single molecule biology, and all I'm measuring is this F equals minus KX. All right, so I just measure, I know K, because I've calibrated the system, and I measure X and I infer the force that's exerted. Okay, but in that case, uh, when you give an interpretation in terms of forces, so the, if you use this the distance as a calibration factor, it should be like a coefficient, but not the measure of uh, interaction with other things, because you know, the, this interaction relates to the square of interaction, or even volume. We'll talk about, maybe we should talk about that later. I think uh, this, is, this is correct. I, 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 think you're, you're, I think you're worrying about two islands just yes. touching each other, but this, is, this bead is free in a single trap. It's a single bead in a trap. It's like a little pendulum that's just moving and just attached. Okay? So it's not, the bead isn't actually doing the biology thing. All right? It's just like a little spring moving back and forth. So this, this, is, this is absolutely correct. So I'll, sh I'll show you what people do with this. I'll just move on. We can discuss that maybe at the coffee break if you want, okay? Just for time. I'll, I'll skip this. It's an amazing paper by Stephen Block's group in 2005 where they measured um, an RNA, R RNAP dumbbell assay. That's actually one of the tenets of fundamental biology measured. 
let me cut to the chase. Just look at the top right bead. Okay, remember that dispersive signal we've got a force. As you go to the edge, there's a turning over point. All right, see where they've lo located the bead? All right, at that point, the bead just wiggles. It's just pulled, but it's wiggles, and there, K trap is zero. Okay, because the, the gradient's zero. So that's how they do it. Do you see that? Okay, well, you've seen all these videos. That's a little pump you can make. Oh, how do we do this? Let me just say how we make shafts and shape beams. What we do is we use, in this instance, we've used an acousto-optic deflector. So an acousto-optic deflector is a sound wave that creates a grating. And what we can do is by applying the right RF frequency, we can deflect a beam in X and Y. And you can trap multiple objects. Why can we do that? Well, you might say, hold on, that doesn't make sense. Well, it makes sense because it's an overdamped harmonic oscillator and we're in the overdamped regime. Remember the MX double dot didn't matter? We've got a damping term in the KX. So what happens is, it's rather like a laser beam coming through the ceiling here and trapping me, then Martin, and going around everybody in the room and then coming back to me. But you might say, hold on, in that time, Christian, you'll have diffused away. Right? Well, one bit off the coffee. Yes, but my diffusion is very, very slow. It's in liquid, and if you look at the numbers, an acoustic deflector is incredibly fast. So in fact, this is a time shift trap. Each of those beads is only transiently held before the beam comes back. This is very, very powerful and is, in fact, at the moment, still remains the method of choice for biologists to do single molecule assays in this field. You could even make a little golf club. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're trying to get money from the RNA and, uh, and you could even <laughs> add your own sound effects and uh, always get a hole in one, just like I did that. <laughs> But why can we do that? Just to be a physics? Okay, so if you ever seen, if you ever, who's ever spun plates on a pole? You guys need to get out of that some fun, right? So if you spin a plate on a pole, you run around, you can maybe spin two or three. If you're like Superman or something, you can maybe spin a hundred or a thousand or a million. But there'll be a limit because you have to get back to the first one. That's a good way to think of it. How do we put that into physics terms? You put it in, you know, the Einstein diffusion square at 2dt. All right, I'm diffusing while I'm away. How far do I go? What's my little d? Depends on my T, and T is how long the AOD takes to get back to me. Put in the numbers for a one micron bead. If I'm waiting for 25 microseconds, I'll have gone five nanometers. It's not very really far. It's a good calculation to do. Five nanometers isn't very far, but if you're doing a single molecule assay on kinesin and microtubules, that would be a bit of a big error. So you have to think about that if you're using this. This is just something to think about, whether the limitation of where you might use this or not. So instead of acousto-optics, people would like to use um, other technology. Now, to steer a beam, right, so this is OO's objective lens. If I want to make a spot not here but here, I can come into the objective at an angle. All right? That is equivalent of me buying a piece of glass and placing it here. That's a pretty stupid thing to do, isn't it? You're not going to do that, right? We're not going to do that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to mimic that. OK? So I'm going to mimic the equivalent of a prism at the back aperture of my microscope objective. So what I'm going to do is add a prism function at a conjugate plane. What's a conjugate plane? It means in most, and all confocal, multifocal, I'm going to talk about this, but if you have a microscope objective and I have a beam, it's got to go through this point at every time, every time I steer the beam. To do that, you use conjugate optics. You basically image that point to some mirror or point back earlier in your optical train. You do that with two lenses. If I image that, every time I move this, all I'm really doing is steering here. Okay? Some of you will know that, some of you may not. Have a look at it. So what I'm going to do is on that point back here, I'm going to create a prism. How do we do that? There's a number of ways, but a light liquid crystal modulator, rather like the technology in this data projector, can do that. This is an array of liquid crystal droplets that, with, that you can actually compute a program to create a prism or a Fresnel lens or anything, and then the lens is a bad color I picked. But if you, the lens basically then does a Fourier transform. Remember what Colin was saying? You know, object to image is actually a double Fourier transform. The lens performs a Fourier transform, adds a quadratic phase, right, to your map, to your system. So you can create this, and if you take the Fourier transform of that and put it on there, you're in business. So I could create an array of patterns so I multiplex the light out. And there's a whole lot of lectures on time I could tell you. Doing that and how we do it, 
But these are the things that you might do. A linear phase modulation is the ramp, it's a prism. You don't have a prism, all you have is little steps, right? Like a Fresnel lens, that's a grating. That deflects my being left and right, or up and down. I want to go in and out. Let's do that. How do I do that? I use this sort of Warner Brothers pattern, that's a Fresnel lens. And I add the two, and that means I can move left and right, and up and down. If I do that, you can do incredible things. These are just two examples from two different groups. One from our group, one from a group in Illinois. Um, so here they're actually cell patterning bacteria on biofilms, for example, um, in, in, uh, in the top there, um, with less than a few milliwatt per trap. Um, and they're using it, embedding in hydrogel. And here what we're doing is just doing a multiplex array and looking at trap stiffness for red blood cells. Um, so this is a system, the, the little white crosses are not biology, they're just our computer program. <laughs> it's for the trap style, okay? Alright, so you can do this, you can do cell rotation, you can do that and then do a beautiful study on that. Okay? Why in hydrogel? Um, because I think they can add drugs and the bacteria survive, it's just a good happy medium for them to use that. There are quite a few people doing that type of thing, that's actually a growth area at the moment, active matter. So I've been studying bacteria, a lot of people are using traps and other it things. It sounds about quite viscous, so yeah. wouldn't that make it more difficult to move the cells? It would. I can't say what their particular study was off the top of my head. I don't remember which, what this paper was trying to do exactly. Maybe just to embed them and then fix them, just so they could take a picture quite easily. Um, but hydrogels are becoming quite important for lots of people, but you're right, they are. It is very viscous. It's a good question, I should have a, I love to look at that paper. Maybe it's just to do a proof of principle, nothing more. But it wasn't biophysical journals that may have had different reasons. Um, I'll come back to this. You've heard of a Bessel function. Um, so I'll just see how many. I'm wondering when we should take a break. Do you want to take a break now, Martin? Yeah, if it suits you, it's we can certainly do that. Um, maybe one or two questions before we go? Or yeah, we'll, we'll stop there because I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that it's uh, 4.30 now already. So. Okay. Do we have a question? Or... Okay, caffeine levels are too low. <laughs> so it's pretty warm in here. Well. Then we come back. Okay. Okay, Thank very much. You're welcome.